So, Judges chapter 14. We are in the smack dab in the middle of the Samson epic. <laughs> Samson was a piece of work, as was everyone in his soap opera drama. Um, if you'll remember, we talked about, you know, his birth and his parents were not the swiftest boats in the race, not the sharpest crayons in the box, um, and, uh, but God chose them anyway um, to, to give birth to this deliverer who would come and set the people free from their oppression. Um, and we, we learned that the place of the judge um, when we looked at the words of the names of those places where God began to stir Samson's heart, the place of the judge is in between, you know, justice and mercy. He does both of those. You know, he dispenses that judgment and that, that, that harsh punishment, but he also dishes out mercy. And that is the place of the judge. And we tend to have one or the other, you know, when, when we're the ones being oppressed, you know, we want the judge to dish out justice. When we are the oppressors, we want the judge to dish out mercy. <laughs> you know, so depending on your, your role in the drama, it depends on what kind of judge you would pray for. Uh, and I know we're all thankful that as Jesus is our judge, um, he is merciful, right? He is slow to anger and rich in mercy. And uh, mercy, then, we, we, we learn that mercy does triumph over justice, which is a good thing. Um, but we, uh, we must also keep in mind that God is a God of justice, and he will not deny his nature. He, he does both. But we are in chapter 14, which is where Samson, uh, a, a, a young lady, catches his eye. And we will learn about this story, but there's a really neat story about a lion and some bees, okay? Um, and I'll break that down for you, and I think, I think you'll be uh, surprised at, at how the gospel shows up in chapter 14. Um, so in 14 verse 1, Samson went down to Timnah, uh, at, and at Timnah he saw uh, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So she's not a Hebrew, okay? She is uh, a Philistine gal. And then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now, get her for me as a wife. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, Dear Samson to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he won't marry her, okay? But his father and his mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now, this already I'm seeing, it's almost like a double entendre. You know, you've got, in some ways, Samson, Samson, you can't be marrying a Philistine girl. Okay, it's just, you just don't do that. It goes against the grain of everything we've learned as Hebrew people. You know, we don't go there. Yet he says, no, I want to marry this uncircumcised. They make a point of saying she's outside the, when you, when you read that word uncircumcised, outside the covenant relationship with God, not one of God's covenant people. I want to be with this gal who is outside of the covenant relationship with God. And in my eyes, she is right. Okay? Now, lest we get our, you know, self-righteous <laughs> knickers in a twist, we must remember, what does Jesus, how does Jesus see you? Anyone? What's your best guess? It's only wrong if it's wrong. I see that and I want it. He says, I see that. I know they're not part of the covenant people, but I see them and they are right in my eyes because of the blood of Christ, because but of grace. He, uh, he's wanting to um, go against the, the will of God? Well, not necessarily. 
He's just saying that that's where that's where grace comes in. In a lot of people's minds, especially you know legalistic people, grace goes against the will of God. You know, it's like no, that's not right. You can't you can't sin and get away with it. That's why they see grace. They see that as people getting away with sin. Well, that's not what grace is. Grace covers over sin and then encourages you to get out of it. You know, so the the idea is not I'm going to go and be with somebody who's uncircumcised. I, what happens when, if in the Old Testament, when we learn about the laws and the rules, if you touch someone who is unclean, what happens to you? You become unclean. But in the dispensation of grace, when Jesus comes, when he touches someone who is unclean, what happens? They're clean. They become clean. And that's the, that's the huge difference. So that's kind of what we're seeing here, that Samson is this image of, I'm going after that which is outside of the, you know, he even uses the word, she is right in my eye. Is that the word? That's our clue that we need to look deeper into that when he uses the word right? That's one of them, yeah. Because it's not, uh, she looks good to me. That's yeah. not what he's saying. You know, right. he's saying she is right in my eyes. And, um, and now some teachers would say, you know, that was because they all did what was right in their own eyes. And and that and they tie that into what Samson has done here, it, but isn't that lusting? Pardon? <clears throat> isn't that lusting? If you tie that word right, and and but you would have to literally change the definition of the word right to mean um, I want. But that's not what he said. He said she is right in my eyes, not I want her. Okay. And that's, that's the difference. Um, but when we're reading along, it's easy for us to just superimpose our values and our understanding on the text instead of going, what does it actually say? Yeah, that's what I mean. When I, I see things that I want and I know I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And I go ahead and do it. I go ahead and get it. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't doubt that Samson actually wanted her. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying that he didn't. Uh, and I'm not saying there wasn't any kind of uh, desire going on there. It's just to understand the, the type there that he is going to a woman who is not of the covenant. She's outside the covenant, and yet he's calling her right. And that word right, um, it's just that should draw our attention to it because that's not a normal word, you know, to say about somebody who's outside the covenant. So he's saying... I know what you believe, and I know what the law says, but I'm telling you it's wrong, <laughs> okay? And, and so in verse 4, his, his father, and this is how we know it was the will of God, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, <laughs> okay? Um, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So in other words, I'm using this to deliver my people. That's God's plan. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Uh, so out of nowhere, uh, this lion comes out of the vineyard. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Okay, so um, just the imagery in this little section here you have uh, happens in a vineyard, uh, but also this lion comes out, and it's a miracle, right? Samson grabs the lion and tears it. Uh, as he would a young goat. Now, I don't know exactly how you tear young goats. <laughs> I've never done that before. Uh, but apparently, um, there are folks who do know how to tear young goats. And, but to do that to a lion is a feat. Um, I remember reading not that long ago about a hiker in Colorado who was attacked by a mountain lion. And he turned around just in time to see the lion and he grabbed it, and although the lion did bite him, he was able to get this lion in a bear hug and suffocate it to death, keep it from breathing until it died. 
and then he hiked out of there. And then the rangers came, and they found the dead lion, and nobody believed it. But it was a, they were like, well, it was a juvenile lion, so that's why he was able to kill it. You know, if it had been a full-grown lion, he might not have been able to. But I'm like, guys, don't take away my glory. I just yeah. killed a lion with my bare hands, you know. Baby or not, I just killed a lion. Um, but anyway, uh, this is what Samson does. He tears this lion uh, in, in pieces. Wow. Uh, so after some days, he returned to take her. So he's going back to get his woman, right? He's coming to collect his bride, okay? Uh, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey, and he scraped out it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and his mother, and he gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion. Now, why is this important? Why did he not tell his mom and dad that he got it out of a, a lion carcass? Anybody? He wasn't supposed to wasn't touch, supposed to touch dead, dead things. So he broke his vow, right? Uh, that his mom and dad, you know, had uh, just so steadfastly, you know, maintained his whole life, and he broke his vow. So I'm not going to tell mom and dad, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I, you get that notion that this is not because I think they're dumb. He's like, I don't want them to get mad, so I'm not going to tell them where the honey came from or that I touched a dead body, okay? Uh, and so he says, I don't want mom and dad to get mad. But he finds this, this carcass of the lion and the swarm of bees. And so here's the really neat thing. Now, you got to bear with me a little bit. Um, but it's um, this, this idea of uh, the gospel through, now, be, bear with me, gender inversion. Not, not changing <laughs> genders, okay? I'm just saying gender inversion. When you take the male version of a word, and use the female version of the word, like uh, Samuel and Samantha, okay? So you've got the male version and the female version. And most languages have this male word and female words. Um, and so uh, an example of gender inversion in the, in the New Testament uh, is uh, Jesus Christ was a male, right? Yet when we talk about the body of Christ, that's us, what are we considered? Female. So Jesus Christ is male, but the body of Christ, his body, right? The body of Christ, the bride, the church, is considered female. And so it's like they're one and the same, yet they're both, and it includes both of them. So here what we have is in Hebrew, we have a lion, okay? A lion. And, and, and the lion comes from uh, the verb uh, ara, you know, a lion is ari, it comes from the verb ara, meaning to gather together for eating. So when, if the lion kills a, an animal, all the lions gather and they eat the carcass, right? Um, and so that's where that, that word for that animal came from in Hebrew. It's like the, those that gather to eat. And, uh, and that's a male word. Ari. Well, the female version of that word, ara, is arye, uh, which is a feeding trough where animals gather to eat, a manger. Okay? So the Hebrew word for manger is arye. The Hebrew word for lion is ara. Same word, just one of them's masculine, one of them's feminine. And we don't have this in, in the English language very often, things like this, where you have the just the, it's the same word, but if you turn it feminine, it means this. If you turn it masculine, it means this. Um, obviously, you know the manger is more a little docile. You know, it's animals coming to gather to eat. There's no blood involved. You know, but the masculine version, it's a mess. It's violent. There's tearing. You know, um, and so two different. Uh, one's a very masculine idea. One's a very feminine idea. Then you have uh, bees. If you'll remember, what, way back in the beginning of Judges, we talked about the prophetess uh, Deborah and what her name meant, uh, the buzzer or the bee, 
okay? And that, so the, the Hebrew word for B is Deborah. And they called, you know, the, the B, uh, the, the word literally means it, it is what its sound is. So the buzz, that's what B means in Hebrew. So the buzz. And so when you hear the B, the, the sound that it makes is the name that it is. And, and yet, and so that's the female word for B, Deborah, means its, its sound is its identity. The male version of that, Dabar, means word. So, and, and the, the modern uh, Greek version of that, and I know it's kind of heady stuff, but is Logos. And we call the Logos of God, the Word of God, is Jesus. So, Jesus is the very Word of God. And that's the masculine ver uh, version of Deborah, is Debar. So, Jesus is the Debar. Deborah was the, the bee. Okay? So, what you have here is bees, if you invert the genders of the name, if bees in a carcass providing honey and sustenance for people. You have the word of God in a manger providing life for people. And, and, and so you see this imagery showing up here way back in Judges. And, and you would be like, well, is that rare? No, it happens a lot throughout Scripture. So we'll start to, every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, well, that's the masculine version of that, and here's the feminine version of that. And, and you'll start to see the same pattern repeat again. And that's when you start to see that Scripture is not just these accidental stories that are knitted together. It's just, it's a masterpiece. I mean, it, God was like, okay, I'm going to send, I mean, I, who thinks of this? I'm going to send my son, and he's going to lie in a manger, and he's going to be the hope of the world, and he's going to deliver the world. I know, I'll send a lion, we'll have Samson kill it, and then we'll put some bees in the carcass of the lion, and he'll eat that honey, and he'll give it to his parents, you know, and they'll eat and be satisfied as well. And, and so what we see is this, oh, he did bad, he messed up, he touched the dead body of a lion, he shouldn't have done that. Yet it was all God's idea and his masterpiece of, let me show you what this is all about. And, uh, and so this just... It, over and over and over again. And the more you look, the weirder the story, I think I've said that before, the weirder the story, the more likely you're to see Jesus show up because one, the lion comes out of nowhere, then, and bees are not known for uh, nesting in carcasses, yet it does here. And, and so the bees are in the carcass of the lion and the honey um, on his way to collect his bride, you know, That's what I thought when he's I gone to go get story. his people. I thought, I thought all this when I read this. Did story. you? <laughs> <laughs> when, I first, now, when I first heard about that line, <laughs> lest, lest you think, <laughs> uh, oh, David, wow, such insight. I got that from other people. I, I learned from other people who speak Hebrew, you know, and they're like, when they, and they are the ones who, they don't read it in English. They'll read the Bible in Hebrew, mm -hmm. yet they're English speakers, and they're like, oh, and they start to see these connections because they, they, they read in those languages, and they're like, oh, to a Hebrew audience, that would have sounded like this, you know, uh, that to a Hebrew in that day and age, if you had said, if what I just said to you, oh, the bees were in the a lion, they each all could have gone like, yeah, yeah, the word was in the manger. They may not have known that that meant Jesus, but they would have understood the connection between the words, the masculine and the feminine. The, the, the word was in the manger and, and, and provided life for people. Do you think today people who are Jewish, who talk English but read in Hebrew, Get all of that now? Uh, I think a lot of them do. And, and whether they're Jewish or not, I mean, the folks that I learned this from are not necessarily Jewish. Um, they're just Bible scholars who that's, you know, you guys think I'm a geek. You should meet them. <laughs> they're like, you can't have normal conversations with them at all. Um, I was in a home group um, when I was in college. Uh, we had a church fellowship and then 
the church was so big that we split into little small groups throughout the week. And uh, Rachel and I were just dating at the time, and we joined this this home fellowship. And there were about five other couples, and and then Rachel and then I, and they all were married with children, and and so we were sort of the the you know the odd ones out. Uh, but four of the husbands were computer engineers, and the fifth husband was a painter. He was the only one that I could have conversations with. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like they were all there talking about, you know, just this weird stuff and, you know, weighing air, you know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and um, and so he, he and I just sort of sat in the corner and watched. <laughs> you know? But it was it was good. Anyway, let me move on. Any questions or thoughts on that before I move on? I might not have an answer for you, but Okay. Um, after some days, he returned to take her and turned aside. Oh, I read that already. Verse 10. Sorry. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, uh, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you, if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast, and find it out then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. So it's a deal. And they said, we'll put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. And that just almost confirms what we just talked about. You know, the out of the eater came something to eat. And then out of the strong came something sweet. And in, what's that say? Three days. Three days they could not solve the riddle. And so what you're about to see is a death and a resurrection and a mass redemption. Uh, and, and a lot of times that mass redemption is going to be represented in spoils. Um, we're going to um, defeat the enemy and we're going to take all their stuff. Everything that they took, we're going to take it back. Uh, and then some. So on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire, which just seems so awful, right? But this is, a, and just to give you an idea of the, you know, we look at Samson and David and all these guys, and we're like, boy, they were such violent people, and, you know, they made these brutal mistakes, and look at the people around them. You know, because because <laughs> yeah. they were going to yeah. lose a bet, they were going to burn her house down <laughs> with her and her dad in it. Yeah. Right? That's, uh, talk about escalation. And then, so, uh, have you invited us here to impoverish us? So they're worried that, that we can't afford these 30 linen garments and changes of clothes. And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me. <laughs> 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 you do you not, not love me. me. You have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold, I have not even told my own father and mother. Say, I haven't even told my parents about this yet. Behold, I have not told my father and my mother, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her, because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Oh. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> if, if you hadn't coerced my wife, you would not have found the truth. Yeah, so... Samson has a way with words, does he not? <laughs> so you would not have found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down how many men? Thirty. That was the deal, right? There were 30 guys, 30 clothes, 30 garments, and he kills 30 of them. And he took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, 
who had been his best man. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right, so we have, uh, he, he, he makes good on his bet, <laughs> you know. They figured out the riddle, you know, by, by uh, coercing his wife. And then uh, in order to pay the riddle, he goes down to Ashkelon, which is the Philistine city, and he kills 30 guys and takes their clothes and gives it to these others. So the Philistines don't win out in this at all. Um, the guys who threatened to burn down the, the, the family farm, they make out pretty good, at least in the, in the time being. Well, I'm still not getting why Samson don't get the, his wife. What's this about the best man? Okay, what happened is he, he went back home he mad. He called her a <laughs> uh, Well, <laughs> he went back home mad, and while he was gone, um, the best man steps in, and takes his wife. Oh, okay. And so, I mean, soap opera nice city. People. I mean, this <laughs> daytime people. television <laughs> at its best. And, uh, and so Samson's wife is given to his companion. This happens uh, a lot to the people of God, right? Remember Jacob is there trying to marry Rachel, mm -hmm. and he gets deceived, and he gets <laughs> Deborah instead, you know? And so the marriage customs, you know, they make room for all this intrigue and espionage and under the table deals because everything it was you know we have this modern western romantic notion that it's about love but for them marriage was about you know it, it, the the joining of families and sharing wealth and kingdoms it, these were business mergers more it, than anything it became the art of the deal yeah it was very much those are the art of the deal and they're like Oh well, we're gonna we're gonna give it to this guy, you know, uh, the best man. You know, my version says I don't know that they had uh, best men back then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what your versions say, um, but a, a member of the wedding party, you know, <laughs> was there, <coughs> who was um, probably a Philistine, a friend of the family, maybe the guy who uh, had a high school crush on Samson's wife to begin with. Who knows? Does um, anybody have a version that does not say you if you have not plowed with my heifer? If you had not plowed <laughs> never if you had that. not plowed with my heifer, you would it, not have found out is, my riddle. Uh, I, I have it right here. Yeah, is yours says plowed. Plowed. Yeah. Instead of oxen, I'm uh, guessing. Uh, I say they don't make right any reference to the insulting. Again, it, this was not about romance. It was not about sweet talking. <laughs> it was you saw people as advantageous, you know, for for things like that. So it was, you know, and that's what's difficult for a lot of people to swallow. How can Samson and the things that he did and the, this story? be such a beautiful picture of the gospel and how can he be a foreshadow or a type of Christ and yet also a major heel? Yeah. You know, and how is that possible? David, you know, yeah. how can he be such a, a you know, a, an image of, you know, my kingdom will know no end and yet he's a murderer and a womanizer, you know, at the same time. And so, you know, that's, it's important for us to remember that, you know, God speaking through you is not his stamp of approval on your life <laughs> you know god using you is not his you know if god uses you it doesn't mean everything you do is perfect it just means that god's really good at what he does and he can even use me you know he can even use someone like samson remember and I, this was something i learned uh you know in bible school my old testament professor when we got to the book of judges he said you have to look at the book of Judges like a bucket with a hole in the bottom. That at the beginning of the book of Judges, Joshua, you know, which leads into Judges, Joshua was that you're never, you're never going to meet a man as, as righteous and as obedient and powerful as Joshua. Always did the right thing. And yet at the end, <laughs> the best that God can find, the top, the cream of the crop is someone like Samson. And, and, they, and they do. They go down and down and down. Gideon, oh, such great faith. Hiding in a hole, whining, you know, his kids end up killing each other. I mean, it's just nasty stuff. But it's like the, you know, victorious, epic 
leader, deliverer of Israel, daytime TV. You know, it just goes south really quickly. Um,